Linda, congratulations to you. And now it's time for our panel. First, I begin with Lisa Quiros. Lisa Garcia Quiros, um, I have known for more than a decade. She's been an amazing mentor, a guider of career, and a dear friend. I'm honored to have her on the panel tonight. She's a Chief Diversity Officer and Senior Vice President of Corporate Responsibility at Time Warner. She currently serves as Vice Chairperson of the Board of the Hispanic Scholarship Fund, and she's also on the board of the Apollo Theater Foundation. Recently, Lisa was nominated by President Obama and confirmed by the U.S. Senate to serve on the board of the Corporation for National and Community Service. Lisa is someone whose dedication to her community places high on her myriad list of priorities. Lisa, welcome. Have a seat. Our second honoree and panelist for this evening is Sue Wagner. She's a co-founder and director of Wow. Director of BlackRock, where she served as vice chairman and a member of the Global Executive and Operating Committees before she retired last year. You'll see her name splashed all over the most powerful women in business lists everywhere. She continues to support BlackRock's Women's Initiative Network and believes strongly in giving back and supporting women's leadership. Sue currently serves on the boards of directors or trustees of BlackRock, DSP BlackRock India, Wellesley College, and the Hackley School. Welcome, Sue. Honoree this evening is Bob Moritz, chairman and senior partner of Pricewaterhouse Coopers. Bob understands the need for a diverse presence in the workplace and is and strongly supports the presence of women at the top. Bob is a member of the PwC Global Network Leadership Team, which includes the senior partners from the network's four largest territories. He's a board member of the Swago College Foundation, the Atlantic Council, the Conference Board, and the Partnership for New York City. Now, unfortunately, Bob is unable to be with us this evening, but I want everyone to turn your attention to the screen for a short message from Bob. Good evening. I'm sorry I can't be there with you in person. However, in your great hands, I'm happy that John Maxwell, lead director of PwC's U.S. Board and global retail and consumer leader, is able to participate on my behalf. First, I want to take a moment to thank the National Council for Research on Women for honoring PwC. While we know there is still work to be done, I'm proud of the steps we've taken to make diversity and inclusion a priority at PwC and an integrated element of our strategy. For me, diversity is more than just business. It's actually very personal. Early in my career, I spent two years in Japan. It was there that I experienced what it was like to be in a minority. I didn't know the language, the people, or the culture. It was an eye-opening experience to be on the outside looking in. And it impacted decisions I have made and priorities I've set thereafter at PwC. Another thing I'm proud of is the diversity of my leadership team. I'd like to acknowledge Maria Mose, Chief Diversity Officer, Tara McClemens, Human Capital Leader, and Carol Sawdai, Chief Financial Officer, three key members of my leadership team who are with you this evening in the audience. Each of these leaders bring unique skills and attributes and collectively have enhanced the performance of our leadership team as well as PwC overall. So with that, I want to again thank you for the honor this evening, and please enjoy the rest of your dinner. So in Bob's absence tonight, John Maxwell is going to be joining our honoree panel presentation. He'll also be accepting Bob's award this evening. John leads PricewaterhouseCoopers Global Retail and Consumer Industry Sector. He's a member of PricewaterhouseCoopers Global Board of Partners and U.S. Board of Partners and Principals, which he was elected as the lead director of the board in 2011. John is actively involved in professional affairs, speaks frequently at executive conferences, and has published numerous articles regarding the consumer consumer and retail industry sector. Please join me in welcoming John Maxwell. So I want to start with some of the biggest challenges and also the best ways to make women successful leaders. So start with what's an obstacle and the best way to fix it. So now everybody else is like, oh, I see how this is going to go. <laughs> it's going to be a long panel. I'll, I'll jump in to start. I, you know, I think it really starts at the top, and Bob sets a really good personal um, statement. He's very passionate, and it's not just about what he says. It's about what he's done, and I think that has really cascaded down to the rest of the partners, and it's a big partnership. 
so that we have 2,700 partners in the U.S., almost 10,000 around the world. So when you think about the change management challenges for getting people to think differently, it really is a big deal, and I think it's, you know, over the last decade or so, Bob's predecessors have really worked hard at this, and it is a mindset change around inclusion, around thinking about diversity as a real important strategic initiative. So I think we've made a lot of progress, and we're very honored to be here tonight, but we still, I think, have a long way to go, so and we're working like on it. So it sounds like you're saying, number one, the CEO has to care, otherwise it's a big challenge. Is it doable if the CEO is not 100% involved? I think the leadership team has to all be committed to diversity and inclusion. And then I think that it's, you know, many different programs and reaching many different levels. So I think it's a necessary condition, but not sufficient. Right? You need to invest in programs that um, both encourage women um, to reach their potential, to see possibilities and paths that they may not have perceived, but you also need to invest in helping managers know what it means to get the best out of all of their teams and to want to have diverse um, you know, professionals. And I think that means, you know, for us, that has meant a variety of different programs um, and to keep experimenting and to keep finding the things that resonate with you know, people all over the globe. What do you think is the biggest obstacle for women becoming leaders? What, what's the number one thing that's, that's in their way? I think you mentioned earlier that you were in the middle of reading the Sheryl Sandberg, Sandberg book, and Sheryl Sandberg talks about leaning in and how important it is for women to take responsibility for their careers and to sort of move ahead. I like to think that companies need to lean in too, that really the way the organization of the future is going to be a very different organization when 50% of the leadership is female. So the way decisions are made, the way women engage with employees, the, the thought partnership, leadership in general, is going to invariably change. So it's important for our organizations to be ready for that. I mean, for us, 40% of the layer below our top management is female. A third of our operational top management is female. I mean, we're a changed organization. Um, the only thing that's left to change is the very top, and I, I know that'll change. We have, you know, terrific women that are poised to take on those jobs when they, you know, become available. Cheryl Sandberg in her, her new book, and I'm going to have a chance to interview her, her next week, um, about her book talks about this ambition gap. Do you see that in women, an ambition gap? So, um, you know, the book hasn't even been published yet, so I think it's amazing how much noise it's generating. <laughs> Um, I've actually but, read it, because I know some people are critiquing oh, know, okay. it without reading it, but thanks a um, You know, I, I think that, to me, you know, sort of the level of noise is, you know, sort of started with the Anne Marie Slaughter um, article in Atlantic, and I think um, that there's been a little bit of back and forth as to this question of can you have it all and what does that mean? And honestly, you know, I, I sort of think they both have really good points to make, Anne-Marie, I think, talks about the systemic problems and the institutional support that's needed to advance women's ability to serve. And I think Cheryl focuses, as I understand it, on you know, sort of individual responsibility, and I frankly think both of them are right. I think that, you know, when you talk about the women, um, you know, an individual responsibility and obstacles, I think one of the obstacles is that, you know, we have very unrealistic expectations of ourselves. Right? So this mean? have it all is, you know, sort of having all the guilt because you can never be everywhere and do everything all at the same time. And so I think, you know, and one of the things I've shared with women throughout BlackRock's organization all over the world is you, know, you have to give yourself permission to be flexible. There is no such thing as the right balance all the time. It's a balancing act every single day. And, you know, you're not going to get it right all the time, and that's okay. You just sort of have to bounce back and get on with it. And it doesn't mean that you have to sort of sacrifice your ambition. And I think that my understanding is that's Cheryl's point. At the same time, that doesn't absolve companies from having responsibility. And I, you know, I think that Deborah Spar, who's the president of Barnard, makes a really excellent point as well when she says, you know, it's the reality. We're biologically different. We're wired differently. We shouldn't try to cover that up. We shouldn't try to pretend it doesn't exist. So I would say to companies and to the men, you know, also you should get over it. Like, we are different. Let's embrace that. 
and let's figure out how we can get the best out of everyone. You're talking about some conversations you've had with women about the guilt and the not being able to do it all. I'm always curious, do you have those conversations with men? I mean, do men, are they ever come, no, truly. I mean, do they ever come in and say, listen, I just can't manage it all. I don't know what to do. I, young I have, men, young men. Really? I think ever, with young men. Truly, ever. I, I've had it with young men. I think, step. I think more yeah. so, Soledad, and I think that's a really key point here is that the environment is evolving, I think, to a platform where this kind of achievement that we're talking about here tonight is really possible. And I think it starts with a level of transparency and candor and really having those honest discussions. And I think at PwC, particularly under Bob's leadership, we've really uh, called out the BS and so when someone's, we know where they're dealing with something and we talk to them about it and they say, I'm fine, we say, are you really fine? And usually you get underneath that. But I think there's an expectations management around all of your people need to walk in other people's shoes. They need to be empathetic. People go through different things personally, which maybe they need more flexibility, but then you give that to them and you get such a huge return on investment because when they come back, they love the place and they're loyal. And so I think a lot of it is about your communication, your culture, and the transparency and candor, and really saying to people that this diversity is not an initiative, it's who we are. The only way we're gonna be successful is that if we are inclusive and we bring in people with different points of view, they're gonna bring great solutions, not just to client issues, but helping us deal through the internal strategy issues that we deal with. You know, Soledek, I, I just wanted to go back a second to what you were mentioning, because during this whole Anne Marie Slaughter, Sheryl Sandberg debate, you know, what, one of the things that, that I've been struck by is, isn't it wonderful that we have a choice? And I think it's the obligation of organizations, of companies, to ensure that women have a free choice and that we are not deciding for them what is right for them at their different points of their careers. I mean, you know, I had a, a, a mother and grandmother who said it was important for you to have a college education because I don't want you to depend on any man. I mean, my life is so dramatically different from theirs. And I think that the opportunity for women to choose whatever career path they may have. I mean, I went to business school with women, many of whom have decided to stay home with their children. That's a choice that they made that is fulfilling and a, and a terrific choice for them. And I, and I chose a different path, and I, I think it's great that women today can still do that. Considering all the choice, though, I think sometimes we seem very tortured by the choice. I mean, Anne yes. Marie Slaughter's article was, was, was yeah, tortured. You know, when you, you yeah. read a criticism of, of Sheryl Sandberg's book that has not been released yet, um, and I think, uh, having read it, I think it's a, a fair criticism, uh, is that she's talking to the women and not necessarily to the men. You know, she's sort of like, well, the people in power are, the, in some cases, and a lot of cases, are, are the men. Do you, what would that conversation look like if, in fact, she were not saying to the women, lean into your careers, but she were saying to the men, what? I think, you know, at, <laughs> at, at PwC, how come all the female questions are coming to me? <laughs> no, this is the men. The, well, like yeah, the men. Okay. <laughs> so I, I think it's, for us, the change and the transformation, I think, has been easier because of the nature of our business. We're in a people business, and the only way that we can compete is to have that talent. And there's just not enough white males to serve our clients, even if we thought that that was right, and naturally we don't. So the idea is really getting the expectation of our partners and staff that having cultural dexterity as defined as being able to work with people of all different backgrounds and, and thinking is really a key attribute to be successful in our firm. So if you don't have that attribute, you don't build that into your DNA, you're not gonna get very far with our firm. So a little bit is around you know, diversity being totally on strategy because we need to do it, but a lot of it is around culture to say that it's not okay not to be inclusive at PwC. When Linda was giving her remarks, she talked about her vision of men and women sharing leadership and power. I've been a reporter for a minute, you know, and in the 20 some odd years that I've been doing it, most times I've seen people having to wrestle power out of the hands of other people. Like very rarely does someone just open up and share their power. It just doesn't happen. I, I, <laughs> I, I haven't seen it. I mean, is that a, it's a wonderful goal? Is it a realistic goal? I, I think it's a, I think it's very much a realistic goal. And I think that the world is changing so dramatically 
that companies or organizations that aren't prepared for that change are going to be left behind. I mean, look, we might have a female president in four years. I mean, this, this is, there, there are more women CEOs today than ever before, not to, men, not to say that there aren't many more opportunities, and there should be. But I do believe that, uh, that, the world is, that the world is changing and that we will be sharing power with men. By, first of all, we're more collaborative. So um, we'll, be, we'll, we'll be willing to share power in a way that, that perhaps they haven't Those were the, the people past. I was worried about sharing, honestly. Yeah, yeah. yeah and I, I was going to say, I've been with the same woman for 40 years, and I would like to share power <laughs> once in a while. So that's, I, I could See, get some lessons. my husband would tell you that I wrest power from him at times. <laughs> But I think there's one really key thing. Because I work in that retail and consumer industry, there actually is a higher propensity for women to get to those senior roles. CEO, if you look at a PepsiCo with Indra Nui or a Irene Rosenfeld at Kraft or you know, Brenda Barnes was at, at Sara Lee. And that, but the one thing that each one of those women had when I interviewed them was a sponsor. So they're really, I think they're still, and everybody needs a sponsor. I had a sponsor, and I think, so you, you, know, you can e open up the culture, you can create programs, but you still need somebody to really be that real sponsor for that protege, and that means ownership, not people, just coaching. People talk a lot about the difference between mentoring and sponsoring, so, so why don't you, Sue, take me through that, and then tell me, for each of you, so what's the company doing to uh, attach a, a, a rising individual to a sponsor, and how's that changing their career? So I, I think at, and we've actually talked about this very explicitly, BlackRock and design programs around it, right? Mentoring, I think of as coaching. You know, so being a sounding board, making sure that you are uh, helping someone figure out how to tackle the challenges that they're coming up against. Sponsorship goes beyond that, because it involves your helping, if you're the sponsor, you're helping um, other women, in our case, um, to, you're basically investing your own capital, personal capital, and making sure that that person is getting additional responsibilities. For us, for example, um, you know, in 2011, we launched a program called the Women's Leadership Forum. And it was really designed to expand the reach of our most senior women. Um, and it had lots of different components, but one of those components was that each person in the program was paired with a member of the Global Executive Committee as their sponsor. In fact, one of my sponsors is here tonight. Um, and the idea of that was really to help them see how they can take the mantle of leadership and add more to the company, and at the same time require that they really consciously think about how they're going to then model that same behavior and pay back or pay it forward, as we said. And I think, you know, we had a really good, we were sort of pretty nervous about that because it's the first time and the participants were the guinea pigs and, you know, but actually the success was measured by the fact that, you know, two thirds of the women who were in that program, almost by the end of it, were in new or expanded roles and roles they couldn't necessarily have anticipated. And, you know, to me, even more importantly, you know, as we get more women onto the global executive committees and the other global governance committees, they're role models for the next generation. And you know, from my perspective, and you asked a minute ago about, you know, is it a reasonable goal to get to equality? Well, as a representative of the industry, that's the worst. Um, you know, we're a really long way off. Um, we all are a really long way off, and it's really, it's not a problem of the pool. So it's going to take intervention to get there. And these programs, like the Women's Leadership Forum, you know, got us to a place where we have more women at those global governance committees. And as that becomes more normal, more second nature, that will be taken for granted. But we're a long way off. <clears throat> I actually was thinking today, it may not be my daughter's generation, it may be my granddaughter's. Mm. Does Time Warner have the same, a similar sponsorship program? That sounds very yeah. intentional as opposed to sort of a, we let it happen. Mm. Well, I, I think a, a couple of things. One is, in my mind, the difference between a sponsor and a mentor is that a sponsor is actually moving the chess pieces, right? A mentor can give you great advice, can kind of help you get over a difficult situation or encourage you to go after someone, but it's the sponsor who will actually move the chess piece. And I think that an, in, an important piece of this is actually being very methodical and clear about identifying high potential, high performing talent in your organization 
and then having a plan in place for those people. So it's not just the responsibility of one person, but it's the responsibility of the senior management of the company to ensure that that person is being moved and developed accordingly. That's something that we recently put in place at the company, and I think it's been, um, I'm very excited about it. But look, Soledad, I, I have, been the, 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 the lucky recipient of a number of really terrific sponsors, both men and women in the company. I mean, I, I really, I wouldn't be here without them. And, um, and they were people that were really instrumental in my career in either putting me in a job probably four years before I should have been a publisher of a magazine, um, or helping me become a leader when I was uh, sort of worried about running my business and I needed to sort of lead and not manage. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and even the job I'm in currently right now I was sort of the result of a terrific sponsor of mine. So I couldn't agree with you more. This, this idea of sponsorship is what will allow people, will allow women and people of color to get through what I call the permafrost layer. It's not a glass scene, it's like a permafrost layer. And for women to break through that will take more than, than just a great resume. PwC has a program called White Men as Diversity Champions. I love that, because it kind of lays it right out there, doesn't it? Tell me about who came up with this idea and if it's been successful. So that really comes down to, again, I think Bob's leadership. What we did a couple years ago is we brought a, um, one of our best, less tenured partners, uh, Maria Motes. She was a retail and consumer partner. I worked with her a lot. Took her out of the practice and had her head up the diversity initiative, supported by uh, Jennifer Allen and a number of other great people. And they came to the white men, like myself, and said, <laughs> you guys are great coaches. You're, you're not you're great mentors, you're not great sponsors. And we said, what do you mean? We're just great all around. And they said, <laughs> they said no, you're not. And we said, explain. And they said, here's what sponsorship is. And, and building off uh, what Sue and Lisa said, it really is about owning that person's career. So I'll tell you what I did. I thought I was a great coach. People would come to me for advice. I'd give them advice and off they would go. Once I really started thinking about sponsorship, I was on a client. $20 billion revenue type of client, very well-known uh, company. I had a- Tell us who. Well, I can't tell you the, I can't tell you the name of the company, yes, but their trademark can. is a swoosh. So I'll just say that. Our, our, our privacy, yeah, we wouldn't be able to say any more than that. Uh, but so I had a, just a wonderful, uh, less tenured female partner named Julie on the team. You know, and, and I got to thinking, and it had nothing to do with I was commuting 3,000 miles for the client, but I got to thinking that, you know, the client really likes her, the board likes her, what could we do here to really get her into my shoes and me move into a more senior uh, partner type of role on that account? And it took about two to three years to set the table with the management, with the board, but it worked out great. The client was thrilled. It's really propelled Julie's career because she's rotated off that client and now she's on you know, a number of other large clients. But to me, that was the real difference, is I got involved in those chess pieces and really moving those, not just saying, oh, Julie, you could be really even better if you did this at a meeting or you did that. Really making it happen for her. And uh, I wouldn't have done that, though, if Maria and Jennifer hadn't pushed me. Do you think that the, that the white men helping with diversity is a critical element of it to really propel it forward? Well, I, I mean, I think it's what we said before. It needs to be owned at the senior levels of the firm, the most senior levels, um, and they set the example. And I think that, you know, it was very intentional that we had members of the Global Executive Committee, women and men, serving as sponsors. And, I, you know, so I think you set the pace, and by your ac actions, you then communicate to the Global Executive Committee members all of them, that this is incredibly important and we can really push forward. And they then communicate to their direct reports. And that's how you begin to cascade, just as you were describing before, you get to all the partners. You've got to cascade it down through the organization. And I think it really needs to be driven from top down because otherwise I think we'll move too slow. So what Bob did is a really two-pronged strategy, one internal, so that was really looking at great talent like Maria, like Jennifer, but also Terry McClemens, who we pulled out of a very senior consulting role into our human capital role. And that really sent a message. Then 
Bob also went outside for Catalyst Hires, and he brought in uh, two partners, Carol Sawdai, who came from Skadden Arps and, and the uh, NBA. She had been with PwC before as our uh, CFO, and then also Diana Weiss, who had been uh, with our outside law firm. And that really got our percentage of leadership up to about 35% in just a couple of years. And that, number one, sends a message. But number two, it really creates a lot more of those sponsors, a lot more initiative and that cascading. So I think there's got to be a little bit of brute force to drive the change. Mm -hmm. There's a comment I read that, that goes like this. If Lehman Brothers had been Lehman Brothers and sisters, <laughs> they'd still be around. Uh, <laughs> do you think? I like the way that reads, but I wonder if it's true. Do you think that much has been written about the difference between women's leadership and men's leadership? I'd be curious about your insights on that, and if you think that there's some truth to that comment. Well, having been at Lehman Brothers originally, originally in my career, long, long before, um, you know, I think that um, if you had really equal representation, um, equal voices and equal weight given to the voices, maybe that would have been true. And the reason I say that is because um, I mentioned before the biological differences and, and the fact that women are wired differently. One of the ways that manifests is that women tend to be uh, more conservative um, and take less risks. There's actually, uh, we have a client in Iceland um, who started an investment bank based on feminine values because they took the position that they would not have had the blow up in Iceland if more women had been running banks because they would have been more risk averse and brought more risk management to the fore. So I think it's possible um, that we would have had a different outcome. Last question for you before I let you go. What's the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity for the next generation of young women who are coming into your respective fields? You know, at PwC, I think we really look at that demographic of the millennials very carefully because they're a different breed than we are, male or female. Their expectations around things like flexibility, meaning of work, what they do, how important it is, et cetera. So I think we really need to get more flexible. And I know that's a little controversial right now given what, you know, uh, uh, Cheryl said out at Facebook. But for us, we really look at work as a thing. It's not a place. And we do need to collaborate, we do need to meet deadlines, and we do need to be responsible. But there's ways that we can do that so that people can still have a life, can still look after parents, kids, whatever they need to do. So that's what we're really, really focused on. We're not all the way there, but we're working that really hard. Um, and I would just repeat what I said earlier. I really think that the biggest challenge is, is the challenge. For the next generation, is the same challenge we're dealing with today, which is just unreal, unrealistic expectations. And I think that that's you know, the expectations we have of ourselves and the expectations others have. And so I think that continues to be a challenge and I don't think there's an easy answer. But I think the opportunity is enormous, right? I mean, there's been a lot written about, you know, sort of the next, the third billion, right? We are um, coming up to a time when, you know, the next billion women will be mainstreamed into the world's economies. and you know, the opportunity to serve the global economy to drive future economic growth is enormous. We're going to do that better if we are more diverse in our approach. Well, look, Soledad, more women than men are graduating from college, master's program, medical school. I think the, big, the biggest challenge facing the next generation of young women is going to be finding men to fill top jobs. <laughs> <laughs> Amen, right? A big round of applause for our panelists. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists for their insights. It's been an amazing uh, and informative conversation. I'm going to ask Lisa to come back, uh, Lucy to come back out. We're going to give, ask you guys to remain seated while we distribute our awards to our honorees. Ready? Yeah. So we begin with Lisa. If you'll stand. Lisa understands a prominent role that media plays in our society and the need for women and men of color to take center stage. Lisa is a woman who takes pride in serving others and who utilizes her career in media as a platform to speak up for those who do not have a voice. A round of applause, please, for our honoree. Lisa Kittle. 
Sue has been a pioneer, a role model, a mentor for both women and men, not only at BlackRock, but across the financial industry. She understands the importance of building women's leadership and creating professional spaces for women to support each other. Congratulations to you. A big round of applause, please. And we're going to ask John to accept the award for Bob. Bob is a leading voice in the discussion around diversity and inclusion and is a strong advocate of the development of women's leadership and workplace opportunity at PricewaterhouseCoopers. We're proud to honor Bob as a man who's making a difference for women. Congratulations to Bob. A round of applause. And thank you for accepting on his behalf. We appreciate it. That wraps up our panel and our awards. Please enjoy your dinner. And after dinner, you're going to meet NCRW's new president and the 2013 Trailblazers. Enjoy your meal.